Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in electrochemical reaction. In this lesson, we're going to learn how the galvanic cell works. Today, we look at one of the two types of electrochemical cells, namely the galvanic cell. We already know that redox reactions take place in both types. After today's lesson, you will understand the processes that take place in the galvanic cell and you will be able to describe the movement of the ions through the solutions and the electron flow in the external circuit of the cell. You will also be able to predict the half reactions at the electrodes and describe the function of the salt bridge in the galvanic cell. Finally, you will be able to represent a galvanic cell in cell notation like this. Without any further ado, let's join Simbolelo to tell us more about the galvanic cell. Remember this is a galvanic cell because the redox reactions taking place in the two half cells produce a potential difference. Look at the reading on the voltmeter, it's just below 1 volt. When studying galvanic cells, there are some very important terms you need to know. To help you remember these terms correctly, I'm going to use a diagram of a zinc copper cell, then add labels and terms to the diagram as we go through the lesson. Let's start by looking at the zinc half cell. The zinc half cell consists of a zinc plate placed in a solution of zinc sulfate. The zinc plate forms the electrode of the half cell and the zinc sulfate solution is called the electrolyte. Aren't electrolytes things you drink? And what is the difference between electrode and electrolyte? Good question, Nombulelo. Let's define these terms first. Here's the definition of an electrode. An electrode is an electrical conductor that is used to make contact with the metallic part of the circuit. In the zinc half cell, the zinc plate is where we attach the connecting wire to join the half cell to the voltmeter. The connecting wires form the metallic part of the circuit. This metallic part of the circuit is also called the external circuit. The zinc plate connects the external metallic part of the circuit to the solution of zinc sulfate in the beaker. Notice that the zinc electrode provides a large surface area for oxidation half reactions to take place in this half cell. Now to the electrolyte. Remember the zinc sulfate in the zinc half cell is an electrolyte. So here's a definition for you. An electrolyte is a solution that contains free moving ions and acts as an electrical conductor. Thanks, that makes it quite easy to remember. An electrode is a conductor in contact with metallic external circuit. An electrolyte is also a conductor, but it's a solution of ions. Right, now that we've defined these two important terms, let's carry out an investigation on galvanic cells to find out how they work. Remember that in an investigation, we start by formulating an investigative question. To do this, we have to consider as many variables as possible. So what variables can you identify when you look at a galvanic cell? Take another look at the zinc copper cell and write down the variables you may want to investigate. I think I know some of them. The type of electrode, the type of electrolyte, I suppose the size of the electrodes. Mm, I'm sure there must be quite a few others. That's right, Nombulelo. There are many variables we need to consider. Let's take a look at the list I've made and compare it to yours. The metals used as electrodes, the mass of the electrodes, the size of the electrodes, the type of solutions used in the half cell, the concentration of the half cell solutions, the temperature of the solutions, the reading on the voltmeter or the ammeter, the solution used in the salt bridge, time. As we've just seen, that's quite a long list of variables. That means there are many different investigations we could carry out. 
But remember, we can only measure and compare two variables at a time. So we need to keep the other variables constant. For the moment, let's focus on our zinc copper cell and find out if we can measure any changes taking place at the electrodes. Now, the easiest way to measure a change at the electrodes is to find the mass of the electrodes at the start of the investigation and then measure the mass again after some time has passed. So here's my investigative question. Does the mass of the zinc and copper electrodes change while the zinc copper cell is producing a potential difference? Remember, we must make sure that all the other variables remain the same during the experiment. So let's start by recording the mass of the copper and zinc electrodes. This looks like a very interesting investigation. Simbolello measured the mass of the zinc and copper electrodes respectively before she started the reaction. Her results were as follows. The zinc electrode had a mass of 13,30 grams and the copper electrode was 29,09 grams. It takes a very long time for this reaction to show a measurable change. Simbolello connected the electrodes and waited for a change in the voltmeter reading. Let's join her again to see if there are any changes. Right, now I think it's time to measure the mass of the electrodes again. Let's start with the zinc plate. And the mass of the zinc plate is 13,28 grams. And the copper plate is 29,18 grams. Let's take a closer look at the table of results. What conclusions can you make from these results? The zinc electrode has decreased in mass, but the copper electrode has increased in mass. Uh, well done, that's correct. Now, can any of you explain these results using half reactions? Since the zinc electrode decreased in mass, we can write the oxidation half reaction for zinc as Zn goes to Zn2 plus plus two electrons. And since the copper electrode increased in mass, we can write down the reduction half reaction for copper as Cu2 plus plus two electrons goes to CU. So our investigation has given us evidence that oxidation takes place at the zinc electrode and that reduction takes place at the copper half cell. Now it's very important to note that we name the electrodes of both the galvanic and electrolytic cells according to the half reaction that takes place. The electrode where oxidation takes place is called the anode. And the best way to remember that anode and oxidation go together is that they both begin with a vowel. A for anode and O for oxidation. And the two vowels go together. I won't forget that. Thanks for the help. Now to the other electrode. The electrode where reduction takes place is called the cathode. And the best way to remember that reduction and cathode go together is that you can form the phrase red cat from these words. Will that help you, Nambulel? Huh? Pardon? Sorry, I was just making a sketch to remind me that reduction goes with cathode. Good. So far, we've identified the reactions taking place in each of these half cells of the zinc copper cell. But we need to remember that these cells must be joined together in order to complete a circuit. This is done by the external circuit, which includes a connecting wire and a voltmeter. And the internal circuit made up of the electrodes, the electrolyte solutions and the salt bridge that joins the two electrolyte solutions together. There are two ways we can represent what's happening in the whole cell. Firstly, we can write an overall chemical equation for the cell. And secondly, we can use symbols to describe a galvanic cell instead of drawing a diagram. 
Let's start by looking at the cell reactions. At the anode, this oxidation half reaction occurs. Zn solid goes to Zn2 plus aqueous plus two electrons. The anode of the galvanic cell produces electrons, so it can be labeled as the negative half cell. The electrons produced at the anode move through the connecting wires to the external circuit to the cathode. The cathode of the galvanic cell attracts electrons so it can be labeled as the positive half cell. At the cathode, reduction takes place. Cu2 plus aqueous plus two electrons goes to Cu solid. In the zinc copper cell, a zinc atom donates two electrons to form a zinc ion and a copper ion takes two electrons to form a copper atom. In this cell, the number of electrons donated by a zinc atom is the same as the number of electrons taken by a copper ion. Does this mean that we can cancel these electrons out? Yes, but this will not be the same for all galvanic cells. So please remember to balance the number of electrons by multiplying the half reactions through by a common factor. The final step when writing the overall cell reaction is to add the two half reactions together. Can I try this one? Sure, I'll write down what you say. I think we should start by writing down Zn plus Cu, two plus goes to Zn, two plus, Plus CU. Well done, but uh, remember that you must add in the phase indicators for each substance. So next to Zn and CU, I'll add S for solid, and next to the ions, I'll add AQ for aqueous. I know that, but I forgot to add them in sometimes. Please remember them in future. The overall cell equation shows the chemical changes taking place, but we must remember this redox reaction produces a potential difference too. However, the cell equation does not give us the complete picture. So let's look at the second way of representing a galvanic cell by using cell notation. We start with the anode and write down the symbol for the electrode. In this case, Zn followed by an S in brackets to indicate that the electrode here is a solid zinc plate. Then we add in a single vertical line. The single line indicates that there's a phase boundary. What does that mean? A phase boundary? Phase boundary is just a fancy way to say there is a change in phase. For example, in the zinc half cell, the electrode is a solid that's placed into an aqueous solution containing zinc 2 plus ions. And so we write in Zn2 plus and add Aq in brackets. In our galvanic cell, the two half cells are connected to each other by a salt bridge. And here it is on our diagram. As we saw earlier, the salt bridge is the internal circuit between the two cells. In cell notation, we represent the salt bridge by two vertical lines. I think I get the picture. It's a symbol to show that the salt bridge connects the two half cells. As we've seen, the salt bridge is a very important part of the cell. When the two half cells are connected externally, but without a salt bridge, no potential difference is produced. But when a salt bridge is added, a complete circuit is formed and a potential difference is produced. A little tip, you could be asked to describe the functions of a salt bridge in an exam or a text. So let's identify these now. I think I know, at least part of the answer to this. Isn't it the job of the salt bridge to complete the circuit? Yes, it certainly is, Nambulelo. But apart from the salt bridge completing a circuit, it also keeps the electrolytes in the two half cells apart. This ensures that the copper ions will be closest to the copper electrodes and the zinc ions will be the closest to the zinc electrode. So the functions of a salt bridge is to complete a circuit and separate the electrolytes. We will take another look at the way salt bridge works in a later lesson. But for now, let's complete the cell notation of a zinc copper cell. So far, we've represented the zinc half cell, 
the anode and the salt bridge. Next, we need to write down what happens at the cathode, which is the copper half cell in this example. At the cathode, a copper two plus ion in an aqueous solution gains two electrons to form a copper atom that forms a solid coating on the electrode. So in the cell notation, after the two vertical lines that represent the salt bridge, we write Cu2 plus and Aq in brackets. But there's a change of phase in this half cell too. This we indicate by a vertical line. I think I know what comes next. May I try? Yes, Namulelo. What must be added to complete the cell notation? I think we need the symbol for the electrodes, Cu and S in brackets. Correct, and here we have it. The complete cell notation for the zinc copper cell. Notice that in this example, the ratio of the zinc atoms reacting to the copper ions is one to one. Thank you, Simbulelo. That helped us a lot. But what if the ratio is not one to one? Let's look at the reaction between silver ions and solid aluminium. We use oxidation numbers to identify which substances are oxidized and reduced so that we know the reaction at the anode and cathode. The silver ions gain electrons to form silver atoms. This is the reduction half reaction, so therefore this reaction takes place at the cathode. The aluminium atoms, on the other hand, lost electrons to form aluminium 3 plus ions. That is an oxidation half reaction and will take place at the anode. On the standard reduction potential table, 4B, we find that aluminium is a very strong reducing agent and the silver ion is a strong oxidizing agent. So the oxidation half reaction is aluminium forms aluminium 3 plus ions and 3 electrons and the reduction half reaction is silver plus one and an electron forms silver atoms. During a redox reaction, the number of electrons lost must be equal to the number of electrons gained. So the next step is to balance the number of electrons. So we multiply the silver half reaction by a factor of three so that the number of electrons lost is equal to the number of electrons gained we see that the ratio for the aluminium silver cell is 1 to 3. Try to write the cell notation now. Here is what it looks like. Since the ratio is 1 to 3, we need to include it in the cell notation. So let's just summarize what you should have learned from the video. First of all, the galvanic cell, we've spoken about this before. Chemical energy is converted to electrical energy. And remember that these are spontaneous reactions spontaneous reactions an electrode the definition of electrode is electrical conductor that is used to make contact with the metallic part of the circuit you need to know these definitions this definition of electrode which is an electrical conductor used to make contact with the metallic metallic part of the circuit you need to know you also need to know the definition of electrolyte which is a solution of ions that act as an electrical conductor. Please note the use of the word ions, okay? Remember that so far we've learned two uses of the salt bridge. One, it completes this circuit. How does it do this? By A, connecting the two half cells and two, allowing for the free flow of ions. And finally, it keeps the electrolytes in the two half cells apart. And that's very important because if it didn't do that, if it doesn't keep these electrolytes separate, then basically the battery would run out very quickly and it just wouldn't work. Okay, finally, your cell notation. Your cell notation is always anode, anode solution, salt bridge, cathode solution, cathode. And you must remember to always put in your phases. So if your anode is solid, you need to put in a little bracket in a solid. And if your anode solution is an aqueous, you need to put in an aqueous. Cathode solution would probably be aqueous again, and your cathode might be solid. So always put in the phases. And finally, remember to state the standard conditions of solutions, which is one mole per decimeter cube. So either below the anode solution or next to it, you need to write in 
the standard concentration, which is one mole per decimeter cubed. Right, great tools. There's quite a lot to learn from this video, so please make sure you've gone and studied it. Then go do the questions in the two enable system and make sure that you know this work. Have a great day.